Good morning once again. It's now time to take you back in history and uh, go through some of the major stories and events that happened today in history on the 2nd of February. And we're going back to 1971. He is very, very popular. That name is very popular. If you, if you have been around for a while, you must have heard of the name Idi Amin. It was on this day that he took over power from Milton Obote. Um, it was one week after toppling the regime of the Ugandan leader Milton Obote. Uh, Major General Idi Amin declared himself president of Uganda and chief of the armed forces. Um, Obote was overthrown by the army while he was on a visit to uh, Singapore to attend a Commonwealth conference. And of course, Amin became president. It now became a very, very, very long and treacherous period for the people of Uganda. Back then, Idi Amin was the head of the Uganda Army and the Air Force, uh, you know, which started in 1966, or he took over in 1966, and then he, um, 1971 seized power while Obote was out of the country. Um, in 1972, he launched a genocidal program to purge Uganda of its Lango and Acholi ethnic groups, and later that year ordered all Asians to leave the country, and some 60,000 Indians and Pakistanis fled thrusting Uganda into serious economic collapse. Idi Amin made himself president for life and stepped up his suppression of various ethnic groups and um, political opponents in the military um, and elsewhere. Um, later on, of course, a, a couple of years later, he invaded Tanzania in an attempt to annex the Kagera region and divert attention um, in 1979. It went on many, many years of him just being a total... Um, I don't, I don't know which, which words to describe Idi Amin with, you know, but he was, you know, a, a complete dictator back then in Uganda. Um, he renamed the presidential lodge in Kampala from government house to the command post and disbanded the general service unit and intelligence unit, which was created by the previous government and replaced it with the state research bureau. Um, um, of course, uh, Milton Obote, who we spoke about um, there um, earlier, eventually fled to Kenya and later to Zambia. Um, Idi Amin was also responsible for issuing a decree which ordered the expulsion of 50,000 Asians who were British passport holders. He um, also chased out businesses and, of course, a lot of uh, properties and um, uh, businesses that belonged to the Asians he seized. Um, it's also said that he married at least six women and three of them ended in divorce. If you remember, there's a movie that was made of Idi Amin a um, couple of years ago, late or early 2000s or late 90s, uh, that also was very, very popular. I watched some of his documentaries back then uh, that showed some of the things that he was doing. There's a time that he was uh, said to have you know, eaten human flesh or cut off the flesh of somebody and eaten it. Um, I'm not sure who the person was. I can't remember who the person was now. Yeah. Um, but he is a perfect example of one of, of those... Um, African leaders or dictators that you know nobody wants to ever experience again you know because his story is is nothing to write home about uh, seeing how much power that he he wanted and how much power that he took from Uganda um, there's also rumors that there are times when he you know ordered printing of money uh, for himself um, when the country was you know the economy of the country was you know seeming uh, to be running into total collapse and so he he went all the way basically as a dictator and as a leader of Uganda back then sad Yes, and uh, the next thing that happened today in history, 1990, February 2nd, it was the unbanning of the African National Congress and other political parties that were anti appetite and this was by F.W. de Klerk. Now, on this day, February 2nd, 1990, the state president of South Africa, F.W. de Klerk, delivered a speech. This was at the opening of the 1990 session, uh, you know, of the Parliament of South Africa in, in Cape Town. At that speech, or during that speech, the CLAC announced a set of sweeping reforms, including the unbanning of the African National Congress, the unbanning of several other you know, organizations and political parties that were anti appetite He also announced the release of political prisoners. Uh, we know Nelson Mandela had been sentenced uh, to uh, prison, you know, sentenced to life imprisonment, but he announced that he was going to release political prisoners, including Nelson Mandela, at the end of a state of emergency and a moratorium on the death penalty. People were very excited about this. We saw black and white intermingling, celebrating this. But we saw the white conservationists, you know, calling him a traitor because, you know, that it was the heat of the apartheid movement in South Africa where, you know, there was racial discrimination of whites against the blacks. You know, they will have bosses where 
only blacks can enter or only whites can enter. There will be public places where blacks dare not step foot in. There was just so much racial discrimination. Blacks and whites could not mix, could not intermarry, could not go to the same schools and all of that. So seeing a, a, a white president or a white you know, uh, you know, state president of South Africa coming out to say now that all anti-appetite political parties would be unbanned and that Nelson Mandela would be released, you can imagine just how furious his party members were calling him a traitor. But at the end of the day, we saw that uh, three years later, Mandela and the clerk went on to, to receive a Nobel Peace Prize and uh, Nelson Mandela became president of South Africa in the year 1994. And this you know, process of you know, dismantling all the appetite structures in South Africa began with this speech that F.W. de Klerk gave today in history on the 2nd of February, 1990. Ooh, that was a lot. Yes, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot. And it's two stories from Africa. One of them is, you know, a pretty good one from uh, South Africa. The mm -hmm. other one from uh, Uganda. Um, the Uganda story, I forgot to mention that he was popularly called the butcher of Uganda. Um, led to the, you know, death of almost 300,000 Ugandans in that period. And um, eventually died in 2003. Um, what difference really does that is that with uh, Yaya Jame, the Gambia? I mean, not very different. Not very so different. You see yeah. lots of lots of. I mean, there's a documentary I worked on last year about how, you know, Yaya Jame allegedly, you know, ordered the killing of so many, you know, migrants. They were obviously traveling illegally, but I don't think that's that's enough reason for you to order their execution just like that saying there were machineries these are people who were just trying to find it find a living through the, irregular migration you know so pe people could argue that was wrong indeed irregular migration is wrong but looking at the whole concept and you, you know the the regime of yaya jamea and how he's now gone into exile it's just so sad it really just we still have leaders in the 21st century still, who continue yeah. to do things yes. like this you know and it really for uh, you know for me and this is on a you know lighter note now it, it really just you know reminds you that the idea of karma um, and, you know, when people are suffering in a nation because of bad leadership and they pray and they curse and they do all of that, a lot of times those things may not work out exactly because these leaders, after leading, you know, or causing the death of hundreds of thousands of people, eventually go on to live very, very long lives and maybe die for some, from some illness, you know, when they're in their 70s or in their 80s. Um, but it, it, it really, you, you know, tells you that um, there's a lot more of democracy and the strength of institutions that needs to always come into, into play in Africa. Mm -hmm. And it is the failure and the breakdown of these institutions that lets people take over power in this type of way and, and you know, do as they please. Uh, we're, we've not seen very different. Yeah, Nigeria might be a little better, just a little better, mm -hmm. but since the end of the Civil War, we've seen a few instances where hundreds or thousands um, have been killed, you know, you know, by government forces. Yes. And we still have not been able to hold anybody responsible or hold anybody to, anybody to account. account yeah. So the fact that it was 300,000 in, in Uganda doesn't make the 500 here in Nigeria any different. You know, people still need to take responsibility for the loss of those lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, th there's nothing like a big dicta dictator and a small one. Um, a dictator is a dictator. Yes. You know, someone who doesn't respect the rules of the land, someone who doesn't respect the constitution, a person who doesn't respect, you know, the, the democracy that the country is in, um, you know, is, is not different from any other one. You yes. know, there's, you know, you, you don't make it lighter because the levels are a little different. Still the same thing. Yeah, but, but pff, it's not just in Africa anyway. Even though the situations we've seen here seems kind of peculiar to like one leader, one man coming up to, you know, basically be so authoritarian and so tyrannical. It's not just here. I mean, look at what's happening in Myanmar just yesterday. Yes. Military overthrow just went in, arrested key people, and they're saying they're going to be there for about a year. Anyway, they've been condemned. You know, those actions have been condemned by the UN. So let's just hope that... As always. Uh, and the popular opinion from there is that the Myanmar um, leader, I can't remember her name now, who um, I believe won a Nobel Peace Prize yes, at some point. Nobel laureate, yes. um, she's no different from the Ethiopian leader who also um, won a Nobel Peace Prize. Yes, Abiy Ahmed. Yes. So these are two people that were honored with, you know, the Peace Prize that you expect would be able to carry on that same personality or the responsibilities that come with being given that honor. Mm -hmm. But um, they've acted very different when there were claims yes. of a genocide in yes. Myanmar. She didn't step up. She never took responsibility yeah. or took charge entirely. It almost seemed like she was defending the same people who have thrown her out of power today. Mm. So, um, 
It's a weird world we live yeah, in. Absolutely. Really, really, it is. Really, it is. And that's it here on Today in History on The Breakfast. We'll now take a break to join Kabir Adamu. He is a security expert who's standing by to help us discuss the issue of the retirement and replacement of the IGP. Do stay with us.